one more question and then I'm going to start taking questions from the audience. I know we've got a few that have come in already. Um, your chapter on consciousness and you kind of, to some extent, there's little bits there, which, which are a little bit on panpsychism and some of these, these, these ideas, how much, sometimes if you look on the bookshelves of people that it seems like consciousness is a huge problem. And it seems, and I, then I was talking to someone who does a lot of consciousness studies yesterday and they said, I wish we could just stop talking about it now. Everything's fine. He's kind of on the Dan Dennett side. Where do you find yourself in terms of, of, of human consciousness as a quandary as opposed to a tool? Well, you know, if I was forced to give an assessment, I would say that I surely imagine that science as we understand it, physics as we understand it, is enough to inform neuroscience at some point in the future to give us a convincing explanation of conscious experience. I'm not one of those who thinks that we're missing something essential. I'm not one of those who feels that there's something above science that needs to be injected into reality in order for conscious beings to have the inner worlds of experience that we all have. I think it's just physics acting itself out on particles. Now, having said that, I would certainly note and emphasize that as of today, we don't have the answer. So that's conjecture. That's strong felt conjecture based on my understanding of the history of scientific ideas. But there is a deep mystery that is still with us. And that mystery is how can it be that mindless, passionless, thoughtless particles somehow when configured correctly in say a human brain to be concrete can yield inner worlds of experience? How can the electrons and particles do that? How is it that I have this inner voice inside of my head? How is it that I have this phenomenal sense of reality that's taking place behind my eyes. That's a mystery. Again, I think it's a soluble mystery with science as we understand it, but as yet we haven't done it. And so the proof in some sense will be in the pudding. Do we a hundred years from now have the full answer where we're like, oh yeah, consciousness, that's boring. We totally understand it. Will we get to that place? I think we will, but we're not there yet. No, I've got to choose more wisely on some of the books on consciousness I get. Some of them are just, they're the kind of babble I could come up with. And you can imagine how poor quality that is. Let's start off with, the uh, uh, first question is, is there a point near the death of the universe when all fundamental laws of physics become meaningless? E equals, e equals MC squared or entropy stops increasing? I don't think so. I'm of the opinion that the universe is lawful, fundamentally lawful. And that means that the universe can change over time, you know, from Big Bang till today on to the far future. But the laws themselves in one way or another will continue to be in control. Now, I'm not saying that I know that the laws are static. The laws may, may themselves change over time. No evidence for that, but it's possible. But I would still consider that to be laws of physics, even if they do have some intrinsic, dynamic, temporal quality. I do not think that there will be a realm when the universe somehow changes in a haphazard manner that isn't determined by some fundamental principles that we can call physical law. Now, I was I have this thing, which I, I'm sometimes confused by this, the high entropy, low entropy thing in terms of that when the universe is at its end, I imagined that the the spread of whatever you want to call them, whatever, you know, particles or whatever, that it, it's so the same that in some ways it would be defined as low entropy, but that's not correct, is it? Well, yeah, low entropy is a, is a curious idea. It's a state of, of order. And normally when we think of particles completely dispersed throughout space, that's a great deal of disorder. There's no structure in there. And this can be quantified in a way that we don't have time to go into great detail, but I'll simply mention, if you've got a system where the ingredients can be rearranged in many different ways, and it doesn't change the overall look of the system, then that's generally a high entropy, highly disordered configuration, like a child's room with everything is all over the place. You can rearrange the toys and the games. It hardly changes the look of that messy room. High level of disorder, high entropy. Now, when you have particles that are spread out through a huge volume of space, there are many rearrangements of those particles. Take this electron, put it here, this quark, put, you know, any of these rearrangements, it still just looks like particles wafting through the void. So that's a diagnostic tool for coming to the realization that particles spread out through a huge volume is high disorder, high entropy.
brilliant. Thank you. Uh, this is from Agnes, who would like to know, regarding the two-step entropy model, uh, using star formation as an example, could we consider that the occurrence of cooling somewhere for some time within the general disorder of global warming is also an example of a two-step model? You know, in, in a sense, yes. So in any, I mean, I like to think about the entropic two-step as it plays out in the cosmos as a whole in some sense, but you can look at any isolated system and an isolated system also dances the entropic two-step in the sense that if there's any order that's forming in that environment, generally there's a disorder valve. There's a place in which disorder is being released to a wider environment. And that's true in weather systems as well. So it is a universal principle that if you look at some isolated system, if order is spontaneously forming in that system, then there's got to be some valve in which disorder is being generated at a more quick rate to compensate for the order that's forming. Now, a question from Molly, which kind of it almost goes back to the blue whale thing that I briefly mentioned. Uh, Molly would like to know, how do you feel about the Boltzmann brain theory? And we should explain for people what, what Boltzmann, because I think I'm right saying this is an idea that much like Schrodinger's cat was made up to basically say this is a kind of nonsense and has now instead fed its way into to being used uh, in both si science fiction in particular. Yeah, well, you know, so if you imagine the far future of the universe with particles all wafting through the void, um, there's a weird thing that happens if you watch that system for a sufficiently long period of time, which is anything that has a non-zero chance, quantum mechanically speaking, of happening, if you wait long enough, it will happen. And among the weird things that can happen to a group of particles wafting through the void is they can just through the random motions hap to happen to stick together into a glob that may then pull in a few more particles into a larger glob. And that glob can be any configuration allowed by the laws of physics. And among those configurations is a human brain. So weirdly enough, when you have particles floating through the void, there's a non-zero chance that a human brain can spontaneously form from the motion of those particles if you wait long enough. In fact, you can calculate how long you have to wait, about 10 to the 10 to the 68 years. And so a Boltzmann brain is a brain that spontaneously forms from the random motion of particles wafting through the void. Now, there are a lot of philosophical issues that this raises. Perhaps the most concrete one of is, could it be that right now you and I are all just Boltzmann brains floating through the void? And the answer is in principle, yes, because if a brain has the right configuration, It'll have memories. What is a memory? It's just a configuration of particles inside our heads. What's an experience? An experience is a memory of a configuration of particles inside of our heads. And so if you have a spontaneously formed brain in the void, whose particle arrangement happens to say exactly mirror my particle arrangement right now, that brain will think it's me. It'll have all my memories, all my experiences, and that brain will be out there. It might even think that it's having a conversation with you, Rob, and if the configuration of particles is just right. Now, do I think I'm a brain floating in the void? I don't. As you say, Rob, and most of us physicists view this as a kind of diagnostic tool where we interrogate our theories and ask, how likely is it that we are a Boltzmann brain? And if it's highly likely, we say, let's think about that theory more deeply, because if we're a Boltzmann brain, then we can't trust our memories of the laws of physics that we believe we learned in school, because if we're a Boltzmann brain, those memories are false. And all we have are particles in our heads thinking that they had a memory of something that never took place. So it creates a quagmire where you can't trust anything. You can't trust your memories or your experiences. And that means you can't trust the very physics that led you to the conclusion that you might be a Boltzmann brain. So it's kind of a self-defeating view of the world. And we try to ensure that our physical theories don't make it likely that we are Boltzmann brains. And it's an area of active research to ensure that that's the case. Uh, Raj has a question. He says, uh, what idea of physics or more broadly science most frustrates you in terms of it being misunderstood in public discourse? Well, I think quantum mechanics is a prime candidate there, as we were talking about before, because quantum mechanics is so counter to human intuition, so counter to human experience, that we label it with words like crazy. 
And then when there are other things in the world that counter human intuition or counter logic, we call that idea crazy. And then people conflate the craziness of quantum mechanics with the craziness of stuff that truly is crazy, period, end of story. And, and, and that conflation, I think, which is sometimes couched in very erudite language. As Robin was saying, there, there are many books you can find where quantum mechanics in principle, at least the word is applied in a way that sounds rational or reasonable, and it's not oftentimes. It's just somebody absorbing the language and then twisting it for their purpose. And I find that quite frustrating. What ideas have you found in your kind of o o over the last 30 years, your increasing understanding? There must have been some that as you bumped your head against them, you thought, this one just seems too crazy. This surely we're going to be able to refute this. What have been the ones that you've perhaps eventually managed to, to settle down with? Well, I think there have been many of that sort, certainly the higher dimensions of string theory. I mean, to imagine a universe that has more dimensions than the three of space and one of time that we experience, that seems like a a crazy idea. I mean, I found it initially and now as well to be an exciting idea. So it's not one where I was trying to refute it. I was just trying to make sense of it. And I spent many decades trying to make sense of the extra dimensions of string theory, you know, but you know, again, we're going right back to relativity. I would even say the kinds of ideas that we teach freshmen in college about time slowing down when an object is in motion. I, I've known about this idea since I was, I don't know, 17 years old. And I, I calculate with it, I understand it. But if I sit down and really think about it, I'm like, that's craziness. That time is not universal. That time and the way it elapses depends upon your motion or the gravity that you are experiencing mind-boggling you know and so but we've grown accustomed to these ideas and so i guess what i try to do every now and then is get back to my first experience with these crazy ideas to re-experience the wonder of how reality differs from what we think it should be based on experience I wonder, there's a, a great line, I, I forget, is it Albert Georgi or, or uh, I probably mispronounced that the, the, uh, in, in the book. Albert St. George. Uh, life, yeah, li life is basically uh, electrons looking for a place to rest. Yeah, yeah, that is him. And, uh, you know, when you, any student who's really looked at the molecular properties underlying life, you learn about, you know, the electron transport chain and you see that everything that life is able to do ultimately rests upon electrons bouncing from one molecular receptor to another trying to as albert saint georgie said find a place to rest and as the electrons undergo these jumps they are releasing energy that living systems harness for the processes that allow us to continue living and so strangely enough if you deeply understand electrons and quantum mechanics you're part way toward understanding the very processes that allow us to live and think about electrons looking for a place to rest. So it's a, a beautiful full circle in which fundamental physics is underlying our ability to understand fundamental physics. A final question we have is uh, thinking about things like the detection of gravitational waves, what in your career has been the most startling achievement of physics? Well, gravitational waves, I think is a pretty good one. I'd also put the discovery of the Higgs boson certainly deserves to be up there. You know, this idea that was pure mathematics back in the 1960s drove people to build a big machine to test this mathematical idea that there might be this fluid like field that fills all of space and gives rise to the mass of particles. It was just equations. And yet 2012, July 4th comes the announcement from CERN that this Higgs particle has been found. That's a stunning achievement. Um, I would say the photographs of black holes taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. You know, black holes, again, come right out of Einstein's mathematics, general theory of relativity. In there, you see the possibility of black holes, indirect evidence over the course of decades, and then the most flat-footed direct evidence, you see the blackness, the hole. And that's why it was published in so many newspapers around the world. So I'd say those are sort of the big three of recent times. But of course, we hope that going forward, maybe the idea of extra dimensions and string theory will achieve that kind of observational 
confirmation. That would be deeply stunning, or maybe even the possibility of other universes. There are, in principle, experimental signatures that our universe is one of many. If we found any of those signatures, mind, mind-boggling achievement if that were to happen. We've got one more question, actually. I think we've, we're not quite out of time. Jerry yep. has a question. Jerry would like to know, if you could go back in time to teach anyone everything you know now, who would it be and why? And, of course, if you could go back in time, you may well tell them to really wipe a lot off the blackboard about the nature of time as well. Yeah, no, if we were to go, if you have the ability to go as far back as you want, you know, you go back as far as possible. You find some smart dude way back in Mesopotamia, and then you advance science by, you know, 5,000 years. But I don't think that's really what the question is. It's like, what historical figure? And yeah, certainly, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, it'd be hard not to choose Newton, because there you've got the crowning intellect of the species. And for him to know where his ideas led, and to understand the deeper reality that he seeded, which we have then pushed forward, and then to say, okay, Isaac, take it from there. And who knows what insights we would achieve with that. So that would certainly be, I think, the natural choice. Thank you so much, Brian. Until the end of time, it's actually, I, this is the big hardback copy. The paperback copy is, it, it is now available in paperback. And uh, also on Tuesday, by the way, I'm going to be back on the How To Academy with uh, Sarah Gilbert and Catherine Green, who developed the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. And on Thursday, I think we have Michael Pollan as well from The Omnivore's Dilemma and uh, Botany of Desire and others. Uh, Brian, have a, a lovely rest of the day. I hope all of you who watch the football uh, end elated uh, rather than uh, crushed and uh, we'll see you again soon thank you very thank you, much. Robin see you